everyone and welcome everyone. This is the first annual Speak Symposium, day two, first session. I'm Dr. Rick Hofer, director of the Speak Project at the University of Texas at Arlington. And we are really looking forward to some great dialogue and discussion around the important topic of amplifying the voice of social workers in policy. And we gratefully acknowledge the support of the Simmons Sisters Fund at Texas Women's Foundation for funding SPEAK. Please note that every session is being recorded and will be available in the coming weeks. Each speaker will present for 25, 30 minutes, followed by discussion and Q&A. We want to acknowledge the land on which the UTA building stand is unseated and stolen territory from the native peoples in this area. We also acknowledge the grave harm brought by colonialism to this land, especially the systemic efforts or attempts to erase indigenous and African identities through slavery and racist segregating laws, segregation laws. So um, I'm really honored to have the speakers that we have this morning in our first session. We're going to start with Suzanne Pritzker. She is from the University of Houston, and she, where she is an associate professor and associate dean of academic affairs in the Graduate College of Social Work at the University of Houston. She currently teaches master's and doctoral level courses on social welfare policy analysis and political advocacy. She coordinates the Graduate College of Social Work's Austin Legislative Internship Program, which places graduate students as interns during each biennial session of the Texas legislature. She also coordinates the college's political social work specialization, which prepares social work students to engage in systems level change in political and organizational arenas. Her scholarship focuses on how youth become politically involved and she studies the effectiveness of programs to increase their engagement. Her published research includes studies of service learning as a means for increasing adolescent civic engagement and examinations of barriers to civic engagement among adolescents. She also has published studies examining ways that higher education institutions, including social work programs, can effectively promote civic engagement among their students. I have to say that Suzanne and I have very overlapping research interests, and I'm very excited to hear what she has to say this morning. So with that, Suzanne, turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really honored to be here and really appreciate this opportunity to speak as part of the first annual Speak Symposium. So today I want to talk about political justice and voting rights, and why I think this idea of political justice needs to be a priority for us in our work as social workers. So I'm gonna start by introducing us to the concept of political justice. So political justice here um, is really about equal distribution of political rights and political opportunities. Being able to vote without the kinds of restrictions that make it harder for some groups more than others, access to opportunities to express oneself and be heard politically. Political justice is a critical mechanism for pursuing social, racial, and economic justice. We know that those in power respond to those who participate. When people have equal access and opportunity to participate politically, their influence over policies, systems, and structures expands. So for us as social workers, I wanna encourage us to think about political justice today in three ways. Through the lack of access to voting and political rights in the United States that has deep historic roots in systemic racism and which continues today. Through the experiences of people who have been systematically denied opportunities to express their political voices and the personal meaning for people when political injustices that impact them are successfully challenged. So first, I think it's really important when we think about political justice to highlight a few key pieces of US history as relates to voting rights to help us think about political justice today. And I wanna say overall that the United States has had and continues to have a challenging history as relates to political justice. From the start, 
The United States Bill of Rights, which was established to protect so many core rights, explicitly did not protect a universal right to vote. And throughout United States history, even steps to expand voting rights have often been followed by new restrictions that keep political justice from being fully realized. So I wanna highlight a few things. Um, so in so initially um, when a right to vote was granted in the United States, it was granted specifically to white males with significant property. So even white men without, without property, without, without, without significant wealth were unable to vote. So in 1850, the right to vote was expanded to include most white men. But immediately thereafter, we started to see restrictions that have continued um, to show up in different ways throughout United States history. So in 1855, the first literacy test was for, for voting, the first test that tested whether you were able as a barrier, put in place a barrier around literacy in order to vote was instituted in 1855 to prevent Irish Catholic men from voting. This same literacy test that in 1855 was introduced to prevent a subset of white men was adopted widely in subsequent decades to keep black Americans from voting. In 1870, the 15th amendment was explicitly ratified prohibiting denying the right to vote based on race. And this was followed by the Jim Crow era where we saw a ex excessive amount of many, many, many restrictions around the right to vote. For example, um, we saw poll taxes, we saw the literacy tests that I mentioned widely adopted explicitly with grandfather clauses for white voters. Something else I wanna highlight is the way that criminal disenfranchisement was put in place at this time. So specifically, we began to see voting taken away from people who had committed certain crimes. But this wasn't done in an even way. This wasn't done that all crimes lost a right to vote. But more specifically, we saw states take away the right to vote for crimes most associated with black citizens, not crimes believed to be commonly committed by white citizens. So for example, in Mississippi, men lost the right to vote for arson, but not murder, because black men were more likely to be found um, convicted of arson but not murder. In Alabama, men lost the right to vote for beating their wife, something believed to be more common among black men, but not for murdering their wife, which was more common among white men. These laws had a massive effect in denying political justice. In Louisiana, for example, in 1896, 130,000 black voters had been registered. By 1904, just 1,342 registered black voters were in the state. So that was a drop in eight years from 130,000 to 1,300 voters, black voters. In Mississippi, by 1890, just 9,000 of the 147,000 black citizens of voting age were registered to vote. We see also um, in 1920, the 19th amendment heralded a huge step forward in the United States, granting women the right to vote. But even within the women's suffrage movement, there were deep divides around race. Many well-known white suffragists chose to focus on white women's access to vote, specifically at the expense of expanding the right to vote for black men and women. And during this time, even as the 19th Amendment granted women the right to vote, Jim Crow laws were, were in effect denying black women that right. So, as we progressed in through the, 19, the 20th century, um, two major laws that I really wanna highlight reflected great strides. The US Voting Rights Act ended Jim Crow laws, explicitly outlawing discriminatory voting practices, instituting something called preclearance, where the US Justice Department had to review voting laws, new voting laws in states like Texas, um, with, where, where there had been a, a, a substantial history of racially discriminatory laws. Um, Motor Voter Act, um, which I'll come back to in a little bit. This National Voter Registration Act was a huge step forward also in expanding voter registration access. But here we see just nine years ago, eight years ago, sorry for my math, eight years ago in 2013, the United States Supreme Court in a case called Shelby versus Holder struck down preclearance from the US Voting Rights Act. They argued explicitly in the, in the ruling decision that blatant discrimination in voting is rare. So this idea was all that history of discrimination 
and all the need to put in place laws to protect that, that was here no longer. So I'm gonna show you in a little bit why that is not true. Um, so social workers, very specifically social workers have been involved in challenging these political injustices from the early years of our profession. And I wanna highlight a few folks and some of the work um, that social workers have done because I think this is really important as we think about the responsibilities that we have in terms of political justice. So on the left, um, see Jane Addams, who is pictured here as the lone female among the majority male figures at the 1912 presidential nominating convention. She and other female social workers served as delegates to the Progressive Party Convention, registering voters actively campaigning before they even had the right to vote. Um, and then Alice Paul, who in the 1910s as a social worker actively engaged in protests, was frequently arrested, engaged in hunger strikes to seek women's right to vote. In the center is, uh, is Alice Paul, or not Alice Paul, I'm sorry, this is Victoria Earl Matthews, who was born into slavery in Georgia and became later a social worker and a prominent activist. In 1895, she secured over 10,000 signatures in support of a women's suffrage resolution that was brought before Congress. And on the right um, are some pictures of Mary Church Terrell, who was the first president of the National Association of Colored Women, which was founded alongside other black social workers. And she's in this picture holding a sign that says headquarters for colored women voters. The National Association of Colored Women, which was, which was founded in large part by social workers, was the leading black women's voice in the suffrage movement. Um, so I think this is really important to highlight this, this history um, and, and ways that from, from the early 1900s, even the late 1800s, we had social workers really advocating and working to, to challenge political injustice. Another um, social worker that I'd like to highlight is Richard Cloward, who more recently, I guess not so recently anymore, but more recently, um, was a national leader in expanding voting rights in the late 20th century. So in response to extensive barriers to voter registration, he both founded Human Serve, which was a national coalition that organized voter registration drives across the United States, and was a leading advocate for the Federal Motor Voter Act that I just mentioned, the law that provide, improves access to voter registration, that requires departments of motor vehicles to provide access to voter registration, and I think really critical for us as social workers, that it requires federal social service agencies to provide voter registration assistance as well. And this is something, um, I will circle back to this as well, this is an obligation um, for these agencies that is often not carried out. So I want us to think about as social workers, why this is so important to us and how this ties in, whether we're macro, micro social workers, whatever social uh, focus of our social work, thinking about what this means for us as social workers. So I'm gonna play a really quick video um, by, um, this is LaVon Williams, who um, had a former felony, uh, had a felony conviction as a former felon in the state of Virginia um, and ha had just gotten her right to vote back in, in this clip. My name is LaVon Williams and I voted for the first time in the election today. Um, it felt really, really good. As far as I'm very elated, I'm very excited. Just bubbling in those little bubbles, you know, gave me such a sense of power and excitement. I, just, I mean, I just can't explain the, the feeling that I feel right now. I'm just so elated. And um, I hope that, um, my vote makes a difference. Did you ever think you would be voting? You know, I never thought that I would be voting. I never thought that I would be in this situation right now. Uh, if you had asked me two years ago, I would have said, no, I would never vote. But once I got those rights back, once I got that, that letter stating that I could vote, I made it my duty to be here and to put my little, my little bubbles. And I have to emphasize those little bubbles you know, uh, and cast my vote. So, and I want to just, I, I, I have some other videos that I often show and the links are on the side and I'll make sure those are available too, but that share sort of similar sentiments from people who are homeless and, and have been able to vote, people with disabilities who talk about the barriers and then what it feels like when they vote. And so I hope that as you thought about, Man. as you listened to this, you thought about some of the, these themes that came through that's relevant to our social work practice. So when I listen to LaVon Williams, I hear a sense of power 
that came from voting. I hear excitement, hopefulness, meaning, the meaning that it, it made for her. And, and I hear as people talk about what it means after they've faced so many barriers to access to the right to vote, when they vote, they talk about these same themes that LaVon spoke about. They talk about the dignity and worth that they feel, talk about being seen, feeling represented, their increasing self-determination, all these things that we talk about in our work as social workers is core values, core work that we do, what guides us in our work that we do. And so in fact, I on, on this slide, I wrote some of the, these ideas that we hear and all of the bolded phrases on the screen that we're hearing in this video and from others our direct language in our code of ethics. So when we talk about our work, whether as direct practitioners or as macro practitioners that we do, voting and access to, to voting is so critical and is a critical way that we can help support and advance our values. But what are the applications of this history, but also the sense of meaning that comes from voting for us as social workers? We know that access to political participation is unequal. So I'm situated here in Texas, as I know the University of Texas Arlington um, is as well. So I'm gonna focus a little bit on Texas here, but none of this is unique to Texas. Um, I think we are a, a particularly extreme example in some ways, but, but these same patterns um, exist around the United States. So in Texas, we rank consistently at the bottom in terms of voting rate, rates, and we see inequalities Based on race, Black and white citizens consistently vote at higher rates than those who are Latino or Asian. Um, voter registration, we see differences in how one votes by how they became a citizen, by race, by ethnicity, by education. And then it's not just voting and the other civic activities too. So here in Houston, um, this is the top right chart, and I know it's hard to read in detail, but I want to highlight these ideas. Um, the, the, the chart on the top right is the percentage of people who contact public officials at least once a year. The light blue on the top, the top bar is Houston. The, the darker gray, that's Texas. The lighter gray is the United States. When I look at percentage of people contacting public officials, as why is it so much lower in Houston? I could give you lots of reasons. We'll save that for another conversation or later, but, but there are real barriers that make these disparities exist in different locations in different ways that our structures are set up. And I would argue these inequalities, despite what we hear in the media, despite the way these are talked about, these cannot be attributed solely to apathy, to lack of education, disinterest, there is no, I can't argue that people in Houston are much more apathetic than people somewhere else in the country. There's something else going on. There are absolutely structural barriers to political justice. So again, I'm gonna highlight these in Texas knowing that they exist in other ways elsewhere. But in Texas, we do not have access to online voter registration, 42 states and the Washington DC have access to online voter registration. Many of you can go online and register to vote, but we can't. Um, in 2020, there was a court ruling that says, yes, you can register online when you update your driver's license, but only then, but no other time. Seems like a fairly straightforward policy solution, but not something that we can do here. 20 states and DC let you register to vote on the same day that you, uh, that you vote not here in Texas, and in fact, you must register 30 days before the election. That is the longest allowed by federal law. You can have anywhere in that span, but we are one of very few states that require 30 days registration before an election in order to vote. We also have this policy um, that if I want to register a voter in a county, I must be trained and deputized by that county in order to register that voter. I live in Harris County. I live 10 minutes from Fort Bend County. If I want to register a voter, if I am, even though I am deputized and trained in Harris County, if I wanna to go to Fort Bend County or be at the University of Houston and register a voter who lives in Fort Bend County, I must go and get deputized and trained by Fort Bend County in order to register that voter. This is not a system that exists anywhere else in the country, but this exists here. And, is in, and makes it hard. Of course, we have less people registered to vote and voting in this system. Um, many states have voter ID laws. Ours was very explicitly ruled discriminatory against voters of color, was, was replaced by a somewhat looser law, but 
Many states allow student IDs to vote, state human service IDs. We can't use any of those. We can use a concealed handgun license to vote, but not a student ID as an ID to vote. We also see things like that, that occur all over the country, but last minute poll closures, limited poll location in hours. This picture on the, on the screen is a six hour line that voters had to stand in at Texas Southern University, a historically black university, mile away from where I'm sitting right now, um, at Texas Southern University to vote in the March 2020 presidential primary. These barriers explain why we see lower rates of participation. And it's not just in the explicit policy, it's in the implementation too. Even when there are laws that serve to protect and promote voting rights, there's real challenges in trying to carry them out. And these directly impact communities we often work with as social workers. These exist around the country, implementation all the time. So I have actually somebody I've done a lot of work in this area with um, just moved from Texas doing voting rights work in Texas and moved to California. And what she talks about is California has better laws than Texas, but it falls apart in the implementation and that there's a lot of voting rights work to be done at the county level there. So in Texas, we have this, you know, the National Motor Voter Law that requires state agencies that serve people with disabilities to provide voter registration support. Texas has been sued for this because they don't follow this law and deny support to 70,000 people with disabilities per year. We have a right from the Voting Rights Act to provide language interpreters to people. A voter was denied the ability to bring her son to the voting booth with her as a translator because he lived in a different county than she did. She wasn't aware the state law existed so she sued and the court, court ruled that this state law was not permitted by the Voting Rights Act. But think about how many people were denied their right to vote that never knew to sue, that never moved forward with that action and just didn't have the right to vote for the state law that was completely in violation of federal law. Um, we also have uh, pretty strict laws here around uh, voters with felony convictions, um, but we actually, they can restore their voting rights. But when the state had an opportunity to notify former felons that they had their voting rights restored, it was vetoed. And so there's no notification mechanism. So most folks, um, former felons and folks who work with, with former felons are not aware that this is a right that exists in the state. So again, implementation as well. Um, so while these barriers exist, I think it's really important that as social workers, we also be aware of specific voting rights that different vulnerable communities have and our obligations to help support and, make, and, and increase awareness around these rights. People often are not aware of the rights they have. And one thing that we can do to advance political justice is to educate ourselves on these so that we can help educate the communities that we work with. So for example, people don't know that they have a right to bring an interpreter to a polling location, but they do. And in Texas, polling locations must provide assistance in Spanish. But if you don't know you have that right, you're not asking for it. And it's really easy to be told that you don't have that right. Um, I mentioned before um, in Texas, you have the right um, with, it, with, a, with a former felony conviction. Once you're off paper, you have the right to register and vote. And, and people in, in, in organizations that work with former felons don't know this. And the former felons don't know this themselves. There are core rights that if we educate ourselves on, we can help to pass that along. I do not know what my mouse is doing. We can pass that along and share that information. We, there are rights that exist in multiple states to do things like if you are a survivor of violence, that you can keep your address confidential when registering to vote. But this also is not broadcast so people decide not to register to vote because they're scared to have their address be public. So there are very explicit rights and I encourage you in whatever state that you're in to really study up on these rights, get a sense of what these rights are for the client population that you work with to help increase awareness and increase access that way as well. So in conclusion, um, as social workers, we can advance political rights, political justice and voting rights regardless of whether we ourselves are eligible to vote. I know that some of us are not. Um, and this is important that there are ways that we can do this and ways that we can support challenging political justice. We can help individual people gain access to voting. We can support people's awareness about their rights as voters. We can respond to political injustice by reducing barriers for our clients, working to expand voter engagement, 
and we can help advocate for and challenge policies, advocate for policies that promote equal access to voting and challenge policies that disenfranchise voters. All of these ways on the slide range in different ways that in our different fields of practice or our different work that we do as social workers, there are ways that we can help to make voting more accessible what, as we challenge the structural barriers that exist. And I really wanna emphasize this, so many of us as social workers work in agencies that have obligations to provide access to, the, to registering to vote. There are things that we can do in that work to implement our responsibilities to help make voter registration accessible to help educate. Often you'll hear from agencies that we can't educate about this because, you know, politics, it's politics, it's partisan. It is not partisan to educate people about their rights to vote. The things that I shared, for example, about your right to vote as a form of felon, that is not partisan. We can educate about, about how to register, how to vote, your right to do so, what you can bring with you. Um, all of this, these are things that we can do and ways that we can support expanding awareness and access. Um, and I also encourage you to, to really consider what policies can look like, what need, what, why these barriers. I ask people all the time in Texas, ask why is it that you must be deputized? And, and to and train to register somebody to vote. When I lived in St. Louis, I went door to door and registered people to vote and didn't have to have a training for that. I didn't have to take an hour of my day to be deputized to get a certification. But in Texas, we assume this, we just know this, this is the way it is and we don't ask why. And so I just really encourage you in the work that you do to really ask these questions why so we can start to unpack these barriers and really challenge, challenge ways that we, we, we keep people from being able to speak up and participate and influence the policies we have. So I'm gonna go ahead and end here and thank you very much again for the opportunity to speak today. Suzanne, that is a fascinating, uh, really inspiring presentation. And uh, the details that you go into are so important. I think too often we just kind of gloss over things and say, well, yeah, there's, there's problems. But I, I think you laid out very clearly where the issues are. And uh, myself and the other members of SPEAK are, have gone and gotten registered, uh, I mean, trained as deputy volunteer registrars as well. So. We, we know the pain of having to do it in each individual county. So thank you very much for your presentation. Absolutely, thank you. I think, I think we're going to find that uh, our next speaker, uh, Mimi Abramovitz, her presentation is going to dovetail so well with what we just heard. Um, and so I'm, I'm thrilled to be introducing uh, Mimi Abramovitz, who uh, we've been working with uh, in SPEAK. SPEAK has been working very closely with her and the voting and social work uh, group. So um, she is the Bertha Kappen Reynolds Professor of Social Policy at Silverman School of Social Work, Hunter College, and the CUNY Graduate Center. She's often introduced as an activist and a scholar, and both of those uh, adjectives are correct. Her research interests include the U.S. welfare state, poverty, inequality, activism, and the impact of, human, of public policy on human service organizations, all viewed through the lens of race, class, and gender. With Terry Mizrahi, she co-leads the National Social Work Voter Mobilization Campaign, better known as Voting is Social Work. In a member of the Special Commission to Advance Macro Practice and Influencing Social Policy, she's also the, exec the associate editor of the forthcoming Encyclopedia of Macro Social Work. Mimi is widely published in social work and is often interviewed by the print and broadcast media. She's the author of five books and numerous publications, probably too many to count. Trained in community organizing and social policy at Columbia School of Social Work, she has been honored with 15 awards, most recently induction into the Columbia University School of Social Work Hall of Fame and recipient of CSWE's Significant Lifetime Achievement Award. I consider myself very lucky to be able to work with Mimi and to count her as a friend. So Mimi, I, I'm so excited to, to hear what you're gonna talk about on the, on the voting rights and, and democracy being in danger. 
Thank you very much. And thanks for that lovely uh, introduction. And um, I want to say before I start that, uh, Suzanne, I loved your presentation. And I'll tell everybody that I think we've been reading the same history books <laughs> because um, I will, uh, there will be some repetition. But my first dean told me the best way to learn anything is to say it, discuss it, and say it again. So on that, uh, and, and for those who are listening, we did not plan this. This just turned out that way. So I think it's really great. So I'm going to try to share my screen now. So I'm going to be talking about uh, threats uh, to democracy, which um, if you watch the news, or uh, we're hearing that they're mounting every day. This, this talk was prepared before last night's news about the Senate, that, um, the Senate Judiciary Committee report that talked about the way the former president of the United States uh, tried to get the Justice Department to um, uh, end, uh, change the election outcome. So this is a little bit background for that too. So as Rick said, I'm, I'm co-leader of the National Socialist Voter Mobilization Campaign. Um, and I've been asking myself the following questions about um, the viability of our democracy for months. How have voter suppression, election subversion, and false claims of voter fraud affected our democratic institutions? So I'm taking this speak invite as an opportunity to explore this question. You know, I spend much of my time trying to make sure that voting is social work. That is the activism part of my life. But today I want to slow down and to better understand what is going on. Therefore, I'm treating myself and hopefully you to what might be thought of as a thought piece. I firmly believe that thinking is practice, although some might disagree, but I hope you agree with me. So the last few years have been a warning shot across America's bow. We have recently witnessed an insurrectionist mob stormed the Capitol to prevent the counting of electoral college votes. The amplification of false allegations of electoral fraud and stolen elections. A former president and his allies have refused to admit defeat. The Supreme Court has eviscerated voting rights, not to mention abortion. And political leaders intentionally divide us by stoking hatred, racism, xenophobia, and misogyny almost every day. These threats to democracy take place in the context of a record high inequality. A long time ago, Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis warned us, if you will, we can have either democracy in this country or we can have greater wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we cannot have both. We are living with this dilemma today. Now, we may have dodged the bullets that I listed below, but for, but for now, but I don't know if that's still true, <laughs> but we are hardly home free. Even President Biden declared the longstanding guardrails of US democracy have been shaken. And there are warning signs and data in case you are doubting this. Based on studies of the breakdown of democracies in Europe and Latin America, Two Harvard political scientists, Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt, identified four warning signs of democracy in trouble. Unfortunately, many of them are all too familiar to us in the United States. So democracy is threatened when political leaders, one, reject democratic norms or the rules of the game. That is, when they ignore the Constitution, refuse to accept credible election results, sound familiar? promote anti-demic measures such as canceling an election, sound familiar, use or endorse violent insurrection to force a change in government. Oh my dear. Second, when political leaders deny legitimacy of political opponents, they may replace opponents with loyalists, the buy-off or silence dissent, describe rivals as subversive, a threat to our way of life or national security, describe rivals as criminal or related to foreign government. And many of these things are now documented in that report I mentioned that came out yesterday. Political leaders threaten democracy when they curtail opponents' civil liberties, including support laws or policies that restrict civil liberties. Well, Suzanne just gave you a long list of them. Threaten or take away legal action or otherwise punish critics. 
praise repressive measures taken by foreign governments, and finally, when they tolerate or encourage violence, have ties to paramilitary voices, raise or refuse to condemn political violence. I know that's a lot to take in, but when I saw this list, I, so many of them were going on as I was reading about them. The authors concluded, Democracy does not necessarily end with a bang, a violent military revolution, or by a coup. Rather, it ends with a whimper, the slow, steady weakening of critical institutions, the vote, elections, the press, courts, media, political norms. We're going to look at some of these now. What is happening to the vote and elections in the U.S.? I'm going to talk about two major trends, if you will, voter suppression and election subversion. I love the cool for dummies. Um, great graphic that I found. <laughs> anyway, voter suppression is been, has been by design and it has occurred over time. There are three selected periods that I'm gonna emphasize. Some of this is where I will repeat some of what um, Suzanne already detailed. So the reconstruction era, the civil rights era and the current era, which is since 2008. And history reveals, one, we cannot assume that, you, that the United States was a well-functioning democracy until the Capitol riot. And two, the downgrade was several decades in the making. Oops. Sorry, something just happened to my slide. Let me see if I can get this going. There we go. Voter, voter suppression has taken many forms over time, but a distinct and repeated pattern has also existed over time. So first of all, what are the goals of voter suppression? The advocates seek to demoralize the electorate to make people believe that voting does not count, that the system is rigged and that our voting does not matter, the system is rigged and that our vote does not count. And the historical pattern Step one is this struggle in progress. Black people and other persons of color win increased access to the vote. This poses a threat, and the threat is to white supremacy. Then there's a backlash, attempts to disenfranchise voters, and then we're back to step one. I'm gonna look at these three periods through the lens of steps one, two, and three. Reconstruction. Step one, progress, it's a heavy lift. Reconstruction opened the door to democratic rights for former slaves, as Suzanne detailed. The 14th and 15th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution granted newly freed African-American men the status and rights of citizenship, including the right to vote, participate in the political process, acquire land, and hold elective office. Step two, the threat. This progress and much else in the Reconstruction period posed a threat to white supremacy. The backlash, and you see when diversity wins, we all lose. That's the nature of the backlash over and over again. So that white supremacy groups used racial violence and voter suppression to exclude free black persons from the political process to restore white dominance. And this is in the Reconstruction period. Um, they used racial violence, including black massacres and lynching and voter suppression, including Jim Crow laws to achieve this end. The black massacres, at least 26 massacres took place between 1866 and 1920. This is of black communities. Recently, there was a lot of um, discussion about T Tulsa because it was a, a hundredth year anniversary, but there were many others. And then in addition, these other dates on the slideshow continued black massacres. So um, they may have been fewer per year, but they continued. What about lynching? More than 4,400 racial lynchings occurred in the United States between 1866 and 1950. 75% were black persons. The rest were white people who fought this barbaric practice. Jim Crow laws were a second version of voter suppression. Poll taxes, we had to pay to vote, literacy tests, uh, violent disenfranchisement and voter intimidation. And Suzanne detailed those for, as well. And no, the poll tax declined in use, but it was not outlawed until 1964. 1964, 
by the 24th Amendment to the Constitution. So now we'll look at the civil rights period. Struggle and progress, a heavy lift. The civil rights protests were, were movements to undo racial segregation in education, transportation, and many other spheres. Some of the highlights were the 1954 Montgomery bus boycott, and that picture, the top picture is the Rosa Parks sitting on the bus. 1961 were the Freedom Riders. They took a bus uh, down San Mississippi. 1963, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, where King gives his I Have a Dream speech. In 1965, which you've heard a lot about recently, the March on Selma for Voting Rights. Here are some of the landmark cases where we uh, won desegregation. In 1948, Truman desegregated the armed forces. In 1954, the Supreme Court ruled that racial segregation in public schools violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment and paved the way for desegregation in many other areas. In 1956, the Supreme Court ruled that bus segregation also violated the 14th Amendment. And in 1964, the Civil Rights Act prohibited discrimination in public accommodation and federally funded programs, um, hastened the end of Jim Crow laws that had been upheld by the Supreme Court since 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson. And then in 1968, the Fair Housing Act banned housing discrimination. So we were making a lot of progress. Everyone was very excited. Then in 1965, the Voting Rights Act, which outlawed the most common voter suppression tactics, outlawed gerrymandering based on race, established federal oversight of states with histories of violating voting rights. And in 1968, voting rights are extended to 18 year olds, disabled persons and others. And then the 1993 Voter Registration Act, the Motor Voter Bill, which Suzanne also talked about. And this permits voter registration at motor vehicle bureaus, public agencies and nonprofit organizations. And this is where social workers come in. It was this get, opened the door for us to do voter registration where we work. This first picture is um, uh, Lyndon Johnson sign, uh, signing the uh, 1965 Voting Rights Act and congratulating that he's there in front of him is uh, Martin Luther King. The second picture is Bill Clinton signing the 1993 Motor Voter Bill. And behind him is uh, Richard Cloward, who is a professor at the Columbia School of Social Work and Francis Fox Piven, a sociologist at CUNY Graduate Center. And as Suzanne mentioned, they organized the Human Serve voter registration campaign you know, in, 19, in the 1980s and were instrumental, took a long time to get the 1993 National Voter Registration Bill. And they were honored by being present um, at the signing. Step two, the threat. Again, the same threat. So I use the same symbol, graphic, black progress against segregation, posed a threat to white supremacy. The backlash, when diversity wins, we all lose. Racial violence reappears, voter suppression in the form of filibuster and gerrymandering and weak enforcement of voting laws. Racial violence to stop integration was first. In 1963, four girls killed when the KKK bombed the 16th Street Baptist Church, a civil rights meeting place. 1963, Mega Evers, um, I think that date is wrong, Mi Mi um, Mississippi NAACP field secretary is, was assassinated in front of his house. And in 1964, three civil rights activists were murdered in Mississippi, Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner. And you can see these made national he headlines, well, headlines, newspaper headlines in all cases. The backlash. So this time, it, it, racial violence continues. It starts to re, uh, reduce, but we, we start manipulating the political process. So filibuses, I think it was came into being in uh, a Senate rule in 1806, a minor Senate rule, but it enabled minorities of senators to indefinitely block legislation. But beginning in 1946, the Southern Democrats, infamously known as the Dixiecrats from the South, used the filibuster to successfully stall civil rights bills seeking to dismantle those Jim Crow laws. And in 1970, changes were made to 
make the use of the filibuster easier. And that is what we are living with today. Gerrymandering, setting boundaries of electric districts based on the 10 year census count. This allows politicians to select their voters rather than the voters choose their representatives. And this redistricting is going on now and it's gonna be very dangerous to our democracy, the outcome, if it's allowed to continue the old pattern of being partisan used by the party in power in the state to increase their political power. And it's frequently, or say regularly been racialized by concentrating or diluting the number of black voters in a district. There's also been weak enforcement of voting right laws, too little or false information provided about candidates and issues, poll workers poorly trained, ignoring the chronic problems with absentee ballots, voter registration and malfunctioning equipment. Doesn't matter if people can vote or not. Period three, a multiracial society. Step one, progress, another heavy lift. Progress, first black president elected in the United States, Barack Obama, 2008 to 2016. Look at that picture, how young he looks compared to when you see him on the news today. The census, the 2020 census, majority of the US population will be non-white by 2050 as the number of blacks, Latinx, Asians and other persons of color increase. And this has been driven in part by immigration. And another Story of progress is the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement 2013 to the present. It was created by three black women to eradicate white supremacy and build local power to intervene in violence inflicted on black communities by the, by the state and vigilantes. And you may remember that right after January 6th, those yellow Black Lives Matter signs were, um, letters were painted in Washington DC and in many other cities, it turns out as well. The threat, the emerging multiracial society and the Black Lives Matter movement threatens white society. And there's that Confederate flag again. The backlash, same thing. So voter suppression, 2008 to 2016. After the election of the nation's first black president, all hell broke loose, to say the least. Many states passed laws making it even harder for people to vote, especially people of color. You heard the story of Texas, it isn't alone. Shelby County versus Holder, the Supreme Court ended oversight of the states violating the Voting Rights Act, states in violation of the Voting Rights Act. 14 states with the highest black turnout immediately, immediately enacted voter restriction laws. Voter suppression intensifies. So between 2008 and 2018, 23 states created new obstacles to voting. In the first half of 2021, 49 states introduced more than 400 bills that restrict the vote and more are expected. In 2019, the Supreme Court allowed gerrymandering to stand unless changed by the state legislature. They threw it back to the states. Now this list, there are 15, this catalog of 15 current voter suppression laws. I'm not gonna read them all out loud, but they should, most of them are familiar to you if you've been following the story and just take a minute um, to, to, to look over this list. Election subversion, less visible and less well understood than voter suppression. It works because many rules depend on informal norms of official behavior rather than the law itself. And I call those norms when we see them operative, handshake democracy makes it easy to, to um, pay no attention to them. What is election subversion? The losing party seeks to override the will of the voters by subverting, overturning, or undermining an election, seizes control of the election administration and results, replaces existing election administrators with highly partisan officials, criminalizes the election certification process, substitutes preferred candidates for those the voters choose. As of April, 36 states introduced 148 election subversion bills expected to rise to 216 in 41 states. It is backed and fueled by claims of voter fraud. American democracy relies on the losers of elections to respect the results and participate in a peaceful transition of power. Remember those days? 
Instead, a movement called Stop the Steal falsely asserted that President Biden did not win the 2020 election due to voter fraud. And then the former president attempted to overturn legally cast ballots in four states, urged state legislators, leaders to ignore the will of the voters and to give him their electoral votes. He also tried to get his VP not to certify the electoral college vote. The impact made results far more difficult to finalize, damages the legitimacy of, and trust in the government and the democratic process, makes elections unworkable. Before 2020 election, 59% of American voters from both parties said they did not trust the election to be fair. It's a huge impact of this campaign. Consequences. The guardrails of democracy have been shaken. Voter suppression and election subversion have undermined our democratic institutions and the power of the people. And I'm gonna go over these last three things quickly. The press, we have fewer papers and the press is less independent. Democracy requires a free press. Today we have fewer news sources. Between 1970 and 2000, 28% of the daily newspapers disappeared. The number of news journalists dwindled by more than half. And instead we had the rise of polarized electronic news platforms. And the press is altogether less independent. 80%, did you know this? 80% of all daily newspapers are owned by large media corporations that also operate multiple TV networks and various online media venues. It should give us pause. And not surprisingly, there's been a loss of trust in the press. A former reporter asked, a reporter asked the former president why he called the news fake. The former president explained, now listen to this, how intentional it was. I do it to discredit you all and to demean you all. So when you write negative stories about me, no one will believe you. And in 2021, 56% of all Americans, more Republicans than Democrats, agreed with the statement. Journalists and reporters are purposely trying to mislead people by saying things they know are false or gross exaggeration. Again, it's taking hold. Fewer persons of color vote. We had a record burnout, voter turnout in 2020, the largest in 120 years. Yet 71% of white voters cast ballots compared to only 58% of persons of color. And the gap will worsen with new voter restriction laws. Loss of trust in government. And this one really startled me. In the mid 1960s, close to three quarters of Americans trusted the government. This is according to the Pew or other, another public opinion poll. Today, it's less than 25%, an all time low. And this graph documents it by presidential administration. The democracy index, democracy is in trouble. The index is calculated by a British magazine called The Economist and uh, since 19, 2006, it's been doing this. The DI ranks 167 countries from zero to 10 based on five measures of democracy. And it places the countries in one of four categories, full or flawed democracy, hybrid or authoritarian regime. And if you look at the numbers on the right, they show that in 2006, the US was a full democracy. In 2016, it was downgraded to a flawed democracy. And this was before Trump. So this, the downgraded democracy has been decades in the making, as I said earlier. And in 2020, it was downgraded again. The decline reflects the erosion of public trust in government and elected officials. And the DI also ranks uh, 167 nations based on this index. And the US in 2020 was 25th following Canada and the UK. Democracy survived, but so did the threat. Biden took office, but two thirds of Republicans believe Trump won the election. The Democrats, as you know, have a very thin margin in Congress. Organized white supremacists are doubling down. They are not going away. Race, class, and gender inequalities continue to nourish anti-democratic forces. A populist authoritarian is in the wings, ready and waiting. Just a moment on this uh, authoritarianism. Rising authoritarianism will not simply dissipate with the results of election. 
authoritarian regimes emerge by eating out democracy from within, which is what voter suppression and voter subversion do. The decline of trust in US election, the press and the government have gone hand in hand with greater ideological polarization that underpins authoritar authoritarianism. And people have been trying to find out how this happens. Well, people prone to authoritarianism prioritize social disorder, hierarchies and the status quo. They appear to be threatened by increased diversity, the influx of outsiders and changing social norms. Such challenges for them create a sense of insecurity that can fuel support for authoritarian leaders. Post-authoritarianism is activated when someone with a large megaphone plays to voters' fears and insecurities, suggests that a hidden conspiracy backed by the other is undermining our way of life, rationalizes the violations of basic values, norms, laws, constitutional protections, and violence. It is activated when populist leaders claim that voters cannot trust the current experts, judges, and media, paint themselves as the arbor ultimate arbiters of what presents as a threat, suggests that only they can fix things, which I think Trump did after he was elected, refuse to denounce right-wing actions and groups, think Charlottesville, January 6th, the Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, Three Percenters. But never forget, what has done can be undone. Don't mourn, organize, dream, vote, organize. Social workers can and we must restore the legal and political guardrails guard of democracy, require transparency, accountability, and the truth, challenge the concentration of power and wealth, participate in social movements that press for a more equal, just, and anti-racist society. Most immediately, we can support the Election Count Act. We can work to end the filibuster, reform gerrymandering, reform or abolish the Electoral College, undo all voter suppression laws, enact fair vote laws. We have no time to lose. It's not too early. We must mobilize the vote. Start now. Can't say this enough. Be part of history. Join the National Social Work Voter Mobilization Campaign. I had to put that plug in. And thank you. Remember that democracy cannot be taken for granted. Oh, Mimi, how exciting a presentation that was. <laughs> At the same time, you know, it, it's a think piece. So I, I think uh, we'll get some, some questions uh, rolling in here in a moment as people have a chance to um, kind of reflect on on the dangers that we're facing as a democracy. So uh, let me ask a, a first question of Suzanne as we kind of mull over some of the uh, ideas uh, that Mimi uh, presented. But Suzanne, um, there, there's a, a question here that I think is a very practical and useful one. Uh, how do you discuss voter barriers when others say anyone can get an ID, ID or it is racist to think minorities aren't able to obtain an ID. The reason I ask is that there are some I try talking to that do not see disproportional outcomes among marginalized groups as a reason to change the laws. So I, I mean, I think this is an example of the barriers that Mimi was talking about, but in, in a practical sense, what's the, what's the counter argument to the, the arguments that are being made? So, I guess there's multiple levels that I would think about this at. So I would argue that we don't need voter ID laws at all, um, but let's take the existence of voter ID laws. Um, I think like, for example, in Texas, I can pull up this list of seven IDs that are allowed. When there's all these other IDs around the country, there are ways that you can have IDs that are more encompassing or more narrow. Right. So the idea of an ID, if we if we accept for a second that an ID is an is, is, is an important thing to identify yourself when you vote, I think we can we can have conversations about what are those? What do those look like? What why is it that? You know, I would ask somebody, what's in your wallet? What do you use? What you know, you have a student ID sitting there that you use for things. 
why is that okay in these other institutions, right? A student ID, for example, and I just use something that's really accessible to, to many of us on this call. We have this ID and we use it to access all sorts of things and we can take it to stores and we can take it to places and we can use it to show that here's a picture, here's me. We've It's been approved in, in, in a case by a state institution and then it's not being okay by a state institution. That there's these sort of inconsistencies around what is possible and what isn't. Why is this social service ID that has been in issued by the state not okay and is okay in other states. So I think even if we just deal with it in more practical terms that that that, that uh, okay, but let's look at what these lists are. Let's look at the sort of I mean again, why is a handgun license okay and something issued by the state that you know that is about you to access services okay so i think that's one layer i think there's also arguments about who has driver's license and not and access to that they don't don't even have to you know sort of point in some groups but we think about again students you move here and you're not driving here you don't have a car you're not needing to drive you live in cities without public transport maybe that's not the first thing that you're going to do but you have these other forms of identification that are access ex acceptable in other locations and for other things and for other services. So I think those are some ways that like, again, separate from the sort of larger philosophical issue, we can have conversations in a very practical way. Thank you. I hope that, that uh, everyone is listening to your answer and, <laughs> and, and our questioner will, will try that out because I think um, when we just focus on the individual level, we're ignoring the uh, larger level of, of, like you say, what are the acceptable forms of identification and how easy is it for everyone to get to those places to get those kind of IDs? And if I could just add one thing to, to that, that, it's implicitly partisan because the people who, who are these, these particular restrictions are imposed on, some this, the powers that be think they will vote for the other party. So, I mean, who's more likely to vote one way or the other? To some extent, that may be true or false, but to me anyway, it's implicitly partisan um, and these days. Well, and so to use that, because I think a parallel to the idea is actually mail-in ballots. And there have been, you know, all these arguments about we don't want to send out, we don't want to make it easy. So Texas has continued to make it stricter, as have some other states, to access mail-in ballots. And the idea, like the perception is this is partisan. And so some of the argument back has been, let's look at who actually uses mail-in ballots, right? And so it's actually, we like there's data that shows that seniors, that folks in rural areas, that folks who are more inclined to vote Republican are using mail-in ballots. So something that expands access that is, you know, to one group also expands access to another group, right? And so I think some of that are, are ways that on some of these, 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 these things that are, these, these barriers that are coming at, being approached through a partisan lens to sort of unpack that and to look at what's actually going on and being able to say, look, you know, and this is where, like we've seen, we still have these restrictions, but we've seen sort of being able to sort of get movement from legislators when you start opening up, well, what's really happening? And this is helpful for your voters too. Thank you. Um, Mimi, we have a, a question for you as well, uh, which is it, it's, uh, you, you have a very stirring end to your talk, but the rest of it was, was really kind of bleak. And, and besides voting, which is, uh, obviously incredibly important, but, but it seems like there are efforts to make voting more difficult. These are, this is part of a long-term plan by very wealthy uh, donors to conservative causes like the Koch brothers. Um, you know, and, and when I was president of Texas uh, Political Action, Social Work Political Action Committee, we had a few thousand dollars to spread. But, uh, you know, the, the one check from one of the large oil barons, you know, overcame that and a and million dollars extra. How do we deal with just the, the huge disparity in resources that are being devoted to, um, if you want to put it, our side versus their side? Which I know I'm not supposed to say it that way, but it feels like it sometimes. Well, uh, first of all, I think that... Um... Uh, it is bleak, but it, it's also totally real. Our reality is very bleak. Voter suppression and voter subversion, election subversion, is 
undermining everything that social work stands for, everything we are fighting for. And I hate being bleak, but I don't, I actually frankly don't think social work is paying enough attention to even voter registration, but much less the threats to democracy, which is why I started thinking about it. So I think one thing, one thing we can do um, is to help our profession pay more attention to this and take the actions that are in our, that we have the capacity to do. Um, to, answer, to the second, so that's, that's why I've started to talk about this. And I really appreciate the chance to talk about it today. Um, and the, the answer had a, had a big question. I think I'll refer you to Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> I mean, that's it's huge, huge question. None of us have quite the answer to that. But some of their policy proposals and even some of Biden's proposals um, attempt to do that in a way that might that can work in our United States market economy, our version of the market economy. And um, they're not asking for a lot, but they're asking for something more than we've been able to do. And um, look at the trouble that it's having. So I think social work has to figure out ways that when we participate in the electoral process, when we uh, do uh, educate our profession, we, we have to not fall to the trap that the, this is too much for, this is beyond what a capitalist market US economy can absorb because it exists in almost every other capitalist market European economy. So, so I think just as Suzanne said, we have to educate people about voter ID. We have to educate people about what's possible in the United States. And I, I, I talk about sometimes something called non-reformist reforms. Non-reformist reform is, it, it's a concept put out by uh, Andre Gores a long time ago in a book called Strategy for Labor. But the idea is you take a reform that is, seems unrealistic but it's possible within the existing constraints of one's economy and political system. And you, you, you start proposing those. And I think that's what Warren and, and Sanders have been doing all along. Remember Medicare for all. Well, mm -hmm. now that, you know, that was a no, no a long time ago. Now that it, it's become, except for the fight about it, much more commonplace people are talking about it. It's become more acceptable. So if you start talking about these things and, and show that they are realistic, they're not unrealistic. You begin to um, erode the opposition, or hopefully, but at least you get another op a point of view out. And unfortunately, the press always goes for the jugular. It always goes for the fight. So it says, who should, who should we listen to, the moderates or the progressives in the Democratic Party? The Democratic Party is eating itself alive. But that's not really the point, is it? The point is that, um, to me, some, for the first time, the progressives are actually holding their ground as far as they can and pushing that non-reformist reform. They may not get it all, but there's a fight going on that's a good one. The, the press doesn't talk about the issues, it just highlights the fight. So we have our work cut out for us to try to be that alternative voice in these discussions. Can I jump in here for a second? Oh, Sue, so something... And I love the non-reformist reforms. Um, I so when Mimi was talking, and I think speaking particularly to sort of these the threats, the democracy, and talking about sort of the the our, our questioning of information and media and trusting, it brought me back to a quote that I actually shared with my with my policy class last week that I want to share because I think there's a really important piece to this to this question. So this is a quote from Bell Hooks, um, and I'll put it in the chat as well. But she says. Part of our contemporary crisis is created by a lack of meaningful access to truth. That is to say, individuals are not just presented on truths, but are told them in a manner that enables most effective communication. When this collective cultural consumption of an attachment to misinformation is coupled with the layers of lying individuals do in their personal lives, our capacity to face reality is severely diminished, as is our will to intervene and change unjust circumstances. What I want to bring up here from that quote is that she's making a direct connection between this lack of truth, not knowing, not being able to trust information, and our will to seek justice, to challenge injustice. This is intentional. This is intentional. And if we say this is nothing, this is overwhelming, everything Mimi said, like we can't, we can't fight this, we can't push back, that is, that's 
intentional. And so I think some of what we can do as social workers is see it, be mindful of it and not let it get us down and not let it give us up, give up because then we are not challenging it. Then we are accepting that this is what's happening. And I think that's, that's a really it, just important for us to think about because the goal, right? The goal is to get us to accept that democracy is going, that justice is not possible. And, and I think it's really important for us to, to really fight back on that. Right. I, I, to I totally agree with that. And I thought you were going to go to the fake news story because, you know, the quotes in my talk were showing that what Bell Hooks said, I think it's it was is exactly those quotes show that people don't think elections are fair. People don't believe in the government. The, the fake news started not, it started with the, the birthers maybe, and maybe before that. So, so by now, all these years later, it has actually taken hold in the way that you said, Suzanne, and people are really losing their faith in, our, in all that we're talking about. And um, it, I, I'm just totally frightened by that. I am totally frightened by that because it makes our job, what we're fighting for, all that much harder. But just as you said, we have to help help ourselves and other people understand that it is intentional and that it's not, oh, it'll go away or it's a mistake or he didn't mean it. Remember, let Trump be Trump. I mean, you know, it was like that. We can't we cannot tolerate that anymore. And um, and I mean, we I don't just mean social work. I mean, a whole society. But, you know, we're, we're not we're not the strongest profession in the world. We're not the richest profession, but we can we have ac we have access um, and influence, and we reach. We talk to a lot of people, so we can have an impact. Don't mourn, organize. <laughs> well, th we have a, a question uh, from one of our viewers, and I don't know that I'll pronounce the name right, but it's uh, Anupa or Anupa. I'm sorry to massacre your name, uh, but the, the question is, and I'll start with Suzanne, but then I'll want your view, Mimi, as well. Is what else can we do? beyond voting. Obviously, voting is the linchpin. It's the basic. And if, if that's going away, we need to, uh, you know, shore it up. But uh, what comes after voting, in your opinion? Just uh, Suzanne first, and then Mimi. Well, I have lots and lots about this. But I think one yeah, thing that, <laughs> um, as, I was, as I was listening to sort of Mimi's history, too, and also kind of talking about how this has happened, you know, I think about how some of the, th the, the questions about what, you know, about election administration, for example, as social workers, we don't think a lot about who's in those election administrator positions, who's in these local positions that have the authority to influence what happens with our vote, that are in these places that like deter, you know, and I think really, we need to be in positions. We need to be seeking office. We need to be running and trying to be in these local levels and organize. Either we're running or we are organizing, supporting other folks to run because what's happened, and, and it's not just about the voting and democracy. I'm seeing it here in Texas too. What's happening at school board levels and the ways, you know, people are losing jobs because they dare talk about the fact that our, we have racism in our country and school boards are, are doing this and we, we don't look at who's in these positions, who's making these decisions, who is able on a day-to-day -day level, day-to-day -day basis to, to contribute to undermining our democracy or not. Um, so I think one place that I would really, really call attention to um, in addition to voting is actually who gets in positions, whether that's us or it should, I would like to see it be us, but also how we're campaigning and supporting and paying attention to those local level and sort of local level, really on the ground positions that are involved in so much of this. And before well, I we heard yesterday, I'm sorry, we heard yesterday from Shannon Lane, who you know very well, Suzanne, about the campaign school that is open for social workers to learn about campaigning and running for office. So just throw that in as a throwback to yesterday's. Mimi, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, I was going to actually say what you just said oh, about no. the Humphreys Institute and Shannon and Tanya uh, Rhodes Smith, who were training social workers to do just what Suzanne and Suzanne works with them too. We're, it's a small world here. Um, 
But um, so, so I'm trying, your, this question, what to do is really, really hard because sometimes we, you know, you focus on individuals, you focus on small units and you feel like it's not going far enough. And, but I think we have to do it anyway, because that's, that's where we are and that's what we can do. Um, but I also want to say something about social work education, you know, I'm, I'm sort of um, all, all macro. And I mean, <laughs> I, I work with a lot of the macro organizations and, and so as does Suzanne and, um, and Rick. And so um, the balance, the imbalance between macro and micro and social work education works against us in the sense that the, 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 it, the, mac, the micro students get less exposure to the things we're talking about. It's unlikely to talk about democracy, threats of democracy, or maybe voter registration might come up if the teacher is so inclined. But it, and so the Special Commission to Advance Macro Practice has been trying to, for the past 10 years, trying to um, expand macro, mac not practice, macro social work, but all kinds of practice in social work education. And there's been uh, some progress there, but it's, it's really another uphill battle. Um, and, and, so, and, and so it's not only to increase the number of enrollment, but it modify the curricula so that macro students get more exposure to, um, uh, that micro students get more exposure to macro. And I think it was yesterday, someone in the, I think it was here in the chat, someone said, um, or maybe it was somewhere else, too many meetings, but um, that make um, advocacy a requirement for, in, in, as part of continuing education. You have to have, you have to have a certain amount of advocacy, exposure to advocacy courses at, to, as part of continuing education, like you have to cover other material. And at CSWE might consider making that some kind of requirement. I don't know if I said it quite right, but some kind of requirement along those lines. Well, I, I, I want to second uh, that, Mimi, and our next session, I'm not, I'm not cut, closing us down, but our next session uh, is going to be about uh, how to use textbooks as a social justice and advocacy uh, method. And so we'll talk about that uh, in an hour or so. But uh, to get back to this fascinating discussion, um, we, we have another audience question. Uh, how, this is from uh, Jania Hill. How can we highlight the reforms and change with the infighting taking place front and center in the media? What, how is it that we organize people to move forward together instead of focusing on the infighting? And so, uh, Mimi, if you don't mind, uh, just taking a shot at that, and then Suzanne, if you have thoughts, we'll, we'll come back to you. Well, that, that's kind of that kind of is a spin-off of my question about how the press goes for the the fight. Yeah. Um, so these are these are really tough questions because these are not easy things to do and even to figure out how to do. So. Um, you know, I think what Suzanne said about voter IDs is sort of a model for how you go, but you say, okay, what's real here and what isn't real here? So, so you say, you might say, and I'm just thinking out loud now because I don't have a prepared answer for this in my life, but um, you might say that, you know, the yes, there's this fight's going on, and yes, I really feel bad that the Democrats are eating themselves alive and that the circular firing squad, whatever they call it, and that they, they risk losing their control of Congress, but um, we we have to we have to understand that the media is focusing on the fight because it sells newspapers, and that that is part of the way our society works. So then we have to make it expose. Then say, well, okay, let's look at what the fight's about. The fight's about a certain kind of agenda versus another kind of agenda. Do we want a society that, I'm not gonna go through it all now because everybody knows it, but a society that does all these things that promote well-being, or do we want a society that limits those things? And that's what's the fight about. It's an ideological fight. Um, and the ideological positions are grounded in ideological perspectives that most of us teach all the time. So, so our students will understand what conservatives think, what liberals think, what radicals think. And so you can line these positions up with the policies that are coming forward and say, okay, who are you? Where do you stand? And um, what kind of society do you want? And if you want A, then you, you, you go for the, the progressive agenda. If you want B, you go for the conservative agenda. And, and, 
the fight's a legitimate one, but it's the, the power balance in our way our, the Congress is structured right now makes it an, um, an unfair fight, basically, because you, you can't use our democratic institution to have a fair fight in Congress over these issues. So then we can expose that the way, you know, the filibuster, Jerry, and all the things that we talk about all the time. So mm-hmm. I don't know, how's that for a stab <laughs> at that answer? <laughs> Well, I think that the beauty of a live uh, inter- interview kind of like this and with questions from the audience is, is we get unscripted answers and thinking out loud. And I think that's beautiful. I think it's wonderful. Uh, Suzanne, you've been doing a lot of uh, thinking out loud as well. I wonder if you have any thoughts on this question. Or, well, of course you have thoughts, but <laughs> thoughts you're willing to share. <laughs> yeah, so I actually might take it a little maybe kind of give the uh, sort of a big congressional answer. I want to think more about the sort of part about the, how do we highlight the reforms? Um, and I think, you know, as Mima was talking about the media and, and sort of how these sort of newspapers and things are are, held, are, are controlled by, by a smaller set of organizations, I think that the interesting counterpoint is sort of the massive growth of social media over the last two decades and this way that we that we all have access to information and to getting it both to receiving it but to communicating it and this is actually something where I would critique social work education my own program included but we do not talk a lot about communications and I think that there are places and opportunities for us to be part of and alongside others in really Count, you know, counter narratives and other ways of using this media uh, uh, ecosystem that we have currently today to try to bring attention in other ways, right? That so many, when I think about, like, when I honestly, when I ask my students, where do you get your media from? They're not saying the newspapers, they're not saying, you know, the, the, the cable news, they're talking about. TikTok and Instagram, it's not right, like these the other media mechanisms, Twitter. So I think there's opportunities to really think about how can we highlight reforms? How can we highlight what's going on? How can we sort of, you know, separate from the, 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 the way the media is framing these things? But I, I think in social work specifically, I, I don't think we really have worked on the skills to do that. If I could just say, I, I totally agree with that, but I have a worry about moving into that as our major, we have to, because that's where the world is. But I worry about it because it doesn't allow us to do what we did today, spend 20 minutes each developing, explaining what's behind our 243 characters. You know, so, so we have to find a way to get people interested in what the, the, the deep story, the long story. And I find in my, I teach uh, social policy in the master's and doctoral program. And I find that, I mean, I talk like I do today in my class, okay, but against all the rules. And I think that um, the pleasure I get is when students' eyes light up and they wake up. And I think every teacher has that. But I think that what struck me so much is the history part that it's interesting, both Suzanne and I started with that because when students do hear that and learn about it, they do, it does, it really makes a difference on what, what, how they think about what's going on today because they're outraged. Some, not all of them, they're outraged. And so if we, the social media doesn't allow for that. And so how do we put these, and we have to get that kind of in-depth story out uh, outside of the classroom. I mean, there are, you know, the liberal media does try to do that with, but, but, and, but the alternative media also gives, they're not in depth, but they, they sort of counter it with all these mis, mis, this misinformation that was mentioned earlier. So it's a balance because if, if we just go there, we are sort of falling into a trap of, I'm not sure we can win the battle on social media. And so we have to be able to um, do it, but do it very well, which we have to learn how to do, and also find other ways to uh, attract people's interests in uh, in analysis, not just sound bites. Well, this has been such a wonderful conversation that we've had. Uh, it's like my my terrible duty to say it's it's got to end. I mean, we're, it's our, our time is up, and uh, I can't thank the two of you enough. For your fascinating and and like I'm 
I'm at the same point. I'm outraged and like I'm hopeful uh, and I'm depressed and I'm hopeful <laughs> and and uh, I'm not going to mourn. I'm going to organize. And, and uh, so on behalf of uh, Speak, which I haven't really talked about much, but but we're we're so lucky that you two were willing to join us today. And for everyone in the audience, I'm so happy that you were here and got to see this live. And for those of you watching it on replay, uh, do something with it, you know, show it. This is not just an archival record. This is uh, social work in action. So thank you very much to everyone. And uh, I hope to see you back at noon when we're talking about how to use uh, textbooks and other, uh, other ways to promote advocacy in social work that we may not have thought about. So thank you, Suzanne. Thanks for the opportunity for this dialogue. It was really great.